Sunny Bonani. Goedenavond. Uh, my name is Chris Landsberg, and I hold the South African Research Chair in African Diplomacy and Foreign Policy, and also a senior associate at the UJ School of uh, Leadership. Uh, we are here, of course, to launch yet another uh, a book and a milestone by Professor Wally Shoyinka. But without further ado, and before I introduce our other guests, I'm going to ask Professor uh, Sikumbuzo Mgadi, head of the Department of English here at UJ in the Faculty uh, of Humanities, just to uh, make some introductory comments. Prof, you are most welcome. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof, uh, for the introduction. Um, I have been at this podium uh, um, before uh, to introduce uh, two books, uh, and that was last week. And I say every time I introduce a book, a new book, um, that uh, any um, occasion at which we welcome uh, the arrival of a new book is a special occasion. And this occasion is especially significant uh, for the University of Johannesburg because we also welcome our distinguished uh, visiting professor, uh, Wale Shoyinka, uh, who is, uh, as uh, many of you will know, uh, perhaps uh, the uh, ambassador uh, of Africa uh, uh, in, in the world. And uh, he is uh, the first uh, recipient of the Nobel Prize for Literature uh, in 1986, and he has uh, represented Africa uh, all the years that uh, he has been writing. Um, and, and his last book, which I am reading of Africa, uh, is significant uh, for us all uh, uh, to read. Uh, it is, again, um, a defense uh, and, of course, a um, a representation uh, of, of the continent. Uh, the book that uh, we have come uh, to, to talk about today uh, is um, called appropriately, again, uh, The Gods Who Send Us Gifts. It is an anthology uh, of African short stories. Uh, it was launched uh, in London uh, last year uh, at the School of Oriental and African Studies, uh, at which I was present, uh, and Professor Shoinka gave a keynote address. And so I have traveled a bit with this book, um, and uh, I, I think that uh, uh, I have uh, some uh, interesting things to say about it, but I will let those uh, who have contributed to it uh, uh, speak. Uh, about it and speak on it. It is an anthology uh, that marks the 55th anniversary of the historic 1962 Makerere Conference of African Literature in Uganda, bringing together post-independence African writers, many of whom would go on to play major roles in defining Africa's literary history. One of them wrote, we we're amazed that fate had entrusted us with the task of interpreting a continent to the world. Those who gathered included the Nigerian Nobel laureate, uh, our distinguished professor uh, Wale Shoyinka, uh, uh, Chinua Achebe, uh, Christopher Okikbo, the poet uh, J.P. Clark, Kofi Awonio, uh, Francis Ademola, Cameroon Dodo, Louis Nkosi, Dennis Brutus, Ezekiel Mpathele, Bloke Modisane, the African-American writer Langston Hughes, and others 55 years on, and that was last year. Uh, many have joined the ancestors, but Professor Wole Shoyinka will attend lunch as he has come uh, to grace our occasion uh, here. And uh, he wrote the foreword for, uh, for this anthology of, uh, of short stories. Uh, and I hope that uh, uh, we all feel welcome uh, to, uh, to this uh, occasion, and of course, uh, we are also pleased uh, to be in his presence, uh, and I, I, I am uh, especially uh, delighted uh, to uh, sit back and listen to uh, Professor Shoyinka because uh, uh, my education uh, started with uh, Professor Shoyinka's writing uh, and the writings of those uh, who had attended the Makerere conference. So for me, uh, the occasion uh, is particularly significant because it, it constitutes part of my, uh, of my undergraduate and postgraduate education. Uh, thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Prof, and thank you also for your uh, role and stewardship and to see you also um, climbing the ladder and staking your claim um, uh, in this uh, area of uh, literature and, and, writing, and, and writing. So, Professor Wallace Oyinka, uh, our um, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Professor Sina, uh, Dr. Fukuza in the Vice-Chancellor's uh, office, Professor Maria from ARP, who left us from uh, Humanities for Greener Pastures here in the library. Uh, Dr. Osta, Oscar van Yerden, welcome to you. And of course, um, I have to welcome uh, Dr. Ivor Agiaman Dua, um, visiting associate professor and director of the Wally Shohinka Foundation. I also see other members of the executive leadership group. Uh, colleagues from uh, different faculties, you are all welcome for this auspicious occasion as we launch this uh, book, The Gods Who Send Us Gifts, an ontology of African uh, short stories. I will introduce Professor Shiinka uh, later on. Uh, let me now call upon our Deputy Vice-Chancellor, uh, Professor Surab uh, Sina, uh, Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research and Interna Internationalization, to do uh, uh, just a word of uh, welcome on behalf of the university. DVC. Uh, thanks. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Chris has made this job much easier because I had a very long list of dignitaries, which includes all of you, and of course, Professor Wally Sovinka, to you for, for uh, being and joining us uh, this, this evening, but also for the role that you play as a distinguished visiting professor. I do also want to acknowledge Dr. Ivo Argeman uh, Dua for the role that you are playing uh, for us also as a visiting associate professor here at the University of Johannesburg. Uh, I will move uh, straight away into conveying some remarks uh, and I also want to convey my apologies from Professor Chilitsi Marwala, who was stuck with another engagement this evening, but he will be, ho be joining us may perhaps later this evening. Uh, I looked at a couple of things that I thought might be reflective of this, this evening's engagement, and uh, it appears that on the 1st of June 2018, it would be 56 years since the Makerere conference that took that took place. Uh, it seemed rather significant as it was the first conference that dealt with African literature, and I thought that it was a rather significant movement that, that came about. As I was looking at it and its role that it played in English literature, I wondered, uh, and of course we have a Nobel laureate uh, in this discipline, and I wondered whether if we had similar events for other disciplines, uh, perhaps sciences and, and, and engineering, uh, maybe there would be different uh, outcomes and maybe we would also have Nobel laureates in those disciplines. Uh, as you know, that uh, my own background is in engineering. Uh, someone s saw my qualification with an ENG and they thought it had something to do with English. It, of course, is interesting because at 1962, I tried to close my eyes and imagine 1962 and if you try and do that, you would probably get very different imaginations of what it might have looked at. And a lot of that thinking or the imagination might feel uh, to what one conventionally sees in the UK and uh, or, you know, the pictures that you may see from movies. But when I looked at some of these images from Uganda, it didn't look very different. And you can see the connection with the British Protectorate where Uganda achieved its independence in, uh, also in October 1962. Uh, interestingly enough, and uh, Professor Savinka will talk about the conference a little bit later, but I found the conference was called the Conference of African Writers of English Expression. It was organized, and again, one has to keep the context of 1962 in mind. It was organized by the Congress for Cultural Freedom and the Mbari Club, and with the association with Department of Extramural Studies in, in Makerere. It was interesting, cultural freedom and the conference's theme was that it was the African writers of English expression. And so you can really see that today, that aspect of cultural freedom would probably be associated with the freedom of languages. So I think that, uh, you know, again, context uh, is, is quite something. I was also looking at the cover of the book and I was asking you if you had an idea 
because it was interesting. If you look at the cover of the book, it may be on some of the programs, the gods who send us gifts. And the cover has an orange in the sky. Uh, it's not, uh, and artists usually have a very strong imagination when they put this together. Uh, and I wondered, because I looked for this image, I could find the image, but couldn't find the orange color. I wondered if it had to do with something that this, this event had in terms of contestation of epistemologies that it brought about. Uh, you could also see in its cover, you know, the, the different color, the, the different clothing, the dress, uh, uh, code that was used. There were formal dress codes and there were the dress codes of uh, people like Nguji, Nguji Watyongo, which was, uh, who was wearing a, a, the Kenyan uh, dress. So there were some, there was, it was interesting for me to have those observations in the context of languages. Um, it was also interesting that English, or as a language, was both designated as a strength and at the same time, it was designated as a weakness because it has the ability to access different individuals and to different contexts in different ways. Um, I don't want to detour too much because we are running a little bit of, of short of time, but I do want to bring about three questions, and I'm sure that uh, Professor Wally Suvinka, who was one of the individuals that was at the conference, that, is some, uh, that feels to me amazing that we have him here. Let's give him a round of applause for for being here. You know, I think that this venue, by the way, is uh, named after Chinua Achebe, as you know, who was also at that conference. Um, and, uh, and that conference brought in a, a couple of things, and there were three questions which I quote from, uh, which one of them was, what constitutes African literature? Is it literature written by Africans? literature that depicts the African experience. The third question, which, which I also quote, was does African literature have to be written in African languages? I bring about two quotations, which, are, which after this event, there were different bodies of work that developed, as you're aware. And, uh, and one was the body of work, I think, which, and I think there were many, there were not just two. But there were two, I think, that were, were distinguishing, and I think that those two we have engaged with in different ways as the University of Johannesburg with our own quest for being a Pan-African, uh, for our Pan-African quest, for being a Pan-African Institute for critical engagement. And I think that these, co these uh, contexts also came about when we explored the decolonization of knowledge, the quest that, what, that came about w in South Africa in the last two years. Of course, this is not a new quest because it appeared in its periodic phases uh, internationally and, and globally. But I do want to bring these two quotations because uh, I felt that these two quotations uh, are, are bring about the, the different mindsets. One is a quotation from Nguji, which, was, which is from his text, Decolonizing the Mind. Uh, and this, this quotation is, that relating to the English language was that the bullet, that the bullet was the means of the physical subjugation, language was the means of the spiritual subjugation. Of course, you do find that most of his texts were translated to English, probably for the, for the wider axis. I want to quote our Professor Sovinka, which I think is also a very powerful quote. There were several, and I had the difficulty of selecting one. Uh, which is that intolerance has become, I think, the reigning ideology of the world today. The intolerance versus intolerance, and it's taken on lethal proportions. And you can see that this is a, a quotation that is reflective of global and international, and I say this to bring about the distinction. But for me, this was quite interesting because it brings about the, the contestation of epistemology is very much what we represent as a university. Uh, and I think that the English literature was ahead of its time uh, in, at that time because, as I said earlier, that uh, a number of other disciplines could have also uh, developed in similar, way, in similar ways. Um, and perhaps that opportunity is, is always is, is there, and I think it, it's something that we as a university is taken forward. I do want to share one or two things before I close off. Uh, one is an interesting program that I want you to be aware of. It's something that we have just fo formalized, and you may have heard the Vice-Chancellor and Principal speak to this on his inauguration 
which was the Distinguished African Scholarship Program. And we talked about this 26th March, and it is in phase where we are looking at biographies of African leaders. And we're hoping that this type of this uh, journey will bring about engagement uh, to depth of what individuals have done and achieved, but it would also allow us to, to dwell in our own imagination that literature and poetry brings about. Uh, with these words, I would, uh, you know, I know that uh, when individuals, when I was hearing Professor Mgadi, I realized that his engagement with this works, starting from the works that were presented in Makarere, and I'm sure that the presentation today would have others, perhaps like you, that are in the making, who would be, uh, you know, I know that there are visiting scholars here, there are, vi there are postdoctoral fellows, there are doctorate students, there are undergraduate students as well, and I hope that some of uh, you would also uh, be individuals that would be uh, be a, a, an, an Iva, a, a, a Zukiswa, a Mgadi, a professor, perhaps Professor Wally Suinka in the making. We are very inspired uh, to have a Nobel laureate in the midst of those who engage with us as a university. And I think that this inspiration is something that will give us, this event this evening will catalyze that inspiration. Uh, and I know that that will mean good things for us, both in noble and noble ways, the, the, the both of the meanings. Um, I, with, with that, I'm going to hand back. I see that Professor Landsberg and Professor Mgadi, you have changed roles. And I think you have done that so that you can keep me to time. That's great. You are a bigger person, uh, <laughs> Professor Landsberg. Spot on. Spot, on. <laughs> Spot on. And he's looking at me and he's telling me that we are the, I'm out of time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome again on behalf of the University of Johannesburg. And uh, on all engagements like this, we hope to have your partnership. I'm going to hand back to Professor Landsberg. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Vice-Chancellor. And um, uh, just a small challenge to you uh, in the efforts to debunk the myth that uh, engineers are only uh, about under-specking and over-specking. I think it'll be brilliant if you could get that uh, excellent introductory comments into the Mail and Guardian or even the Thinker. So there's a challenge for you. It's not always that I tell my boss what to do, so I had to get that off my chest. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, with your permission, let me just tweak the program a bit. Let me tell you how we're going to unfold in about, um, for about two minutes, how the program uh, will unfold tonight, and then I'll also just do a brief introduction of Prof. Shoinka, and then the evening can just proceed uh, sort of flowingly and, and seamlessly. So... Uh, in a moment, I'm going to call on uh, Dr. Ivor Ajiman Dua, Visiting Associate Professor and Director of the Wally Shoinka Foundation. Um, he played an instrumental role in working with Prof. Shoinka in putting this uh, volume, this book, uh, uh, together. Um, in fact, in a sense, he is literally the wingman of uh, Professor uh, Shoinka. Um, I didn't mention it earlier, but I think it's only proper that I also formally welcome um, Ms. Sukizwa Awana, South African journalist, novelist, and writing fellow at JIS. That is the Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Professor Vale Study, not studies. I hope I got that right. Fantastic. Uh, right. I mean, Prof. Prof. Vale is very uh, uh, good at... at telling us it's study. Uh, welcome to you as well. And she will also read an excerpt for us uh, from this uh, excellent collection. Um, uh, followed by um, Professor Mgadi. You've just heard, heard from me moment, uh, a few moments ago. And he will do a short commentary for, uh, for us. And then, of course, uh, we will ask Professor Wally Shohinka, Nobel laureate, um, in literature and distinguished and visiting professor at UJ uh, to come and share his thoughts uh, on his latest books. You would uh, remember, of course, for those who were there during that excellent uh, evening on the 22nd of September 
last year when Professor Shahinka um, introduced and launched his inaugural uh, lecture as a distinguished visiting professor uh, at UJ uh, on, the, on the theme and topic of long walk to Mandeland. I know some people said Mandela land, uh, but I suppose there was an uh, element of that in it. But, but a man with a distinguished uh, career indeed, uh, Nobel laureate, as I said, educated at Ibadan in Nigeria, Leeds in England, uh, held uh, several uh, fellowships and prof uh, professorships um, in Ghana, in England, Yale, Cornell, Harvard, Emory, and the list goes on. Just one last sentence as I introduce Professor. What I like about uh, how Prof depicts his own uh, writings, genre, and style, of, uh, if you like, he writes mainly in English, but his works are distinguished by the exploration of, and I quote, the African worldview and are steep in Yoruba mythology, imagery, and dramatic uh, idioms. So, Prof, once again, welcome to you. We are glad to have you in our midst. And I should just tell you... Um, and I should just tell you that on Friday at our Soweto campus, Prof will actually deliver another lecture, which is a follow-up on that lecture Prof presented on the 22nd of September last year. I think that's it from me for the evening. You'll be very glad to hear, uh, except directing the traffic. So without further ado, Dr. Iva Ajiman Dua, uh, you are more than welcome, sir. Is that okay? That's fine. Fantastic. Thank you. Good evening, um, Deputy Vice-Chancellor. It's a pleasure to be here, and in particular, the Chuno Achibe Auditorium at this university. It is very gratifying that this university is very Pan-African in the sense of remembering how non-South Africans have helped shape thoughts, both during the apartheid era and now. That it is not only Achibe, a Steve Biko Memorial Lecturer in 2002 with the Steve Biko Foundation who spoke on fighting apartheid with words, but that there is also the Wole Shoinka Auditorium and that there is another one dedicated to the Egyptian writer and Nobel laureate, Nagib Mafus. It is a statement of Sub-Saharan Africa and the Maghrib region's possible literal integration. I suspect that with this naming of an Igbo thinking English language writer like Achibe, a Yoruba thinking playwright and English language master like Shoinka, and an Arab and Arabic language novelist like Mafuts, UJ thinks that languages and cultures of Africa and the rest of the world should dialogue with each other as we seek eternal solutions and common afflictions and goodness. Last year at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, Professor Shoinka remembered colleagues he amazes when we launch the girls who send us gifts. It was on the 55th anniversary of the Makerere Conference of African Literature, and he dedicated his lecture to Christopher Okibo, who died 50 years ago in the course of the Biafra War. In a lecture of nostalgia, which he titled, Thinking Negritude. He took the international audience through the audacity of that generation's overconfidence, which was that they would use literature to overcome the seas of Africa's misfortune as they had started germinating. One of the things I was interested in, in co-directing that conference, which had representation from UJ, was how the current generation of African writers will salute the elders of their fraternity at a time like that. It resulted in the girls who send us gifts, a work from all corners of the continent by exceedingly established and talented new writers. As the BBC commented, it is very Pan-African 
and addresses issues from wars in South Africa, the apartheid violence on the oppressed, as captured in Professor Ndebele's contribution, Amate Du's Leisure One of Kukri and Africa Cuisine, to living in violence in the Congo, to tradition versus modernity in a village in Senegal, finding love in post-genocide East Africa, and more. It has also two stories on Rwanda, and it's very important to remember one of the things that Professor Shoinka's generation pretended to be, or indeed they were, prophets. For in his foreword to this collection, he had intimated that the first signs of the future genocide in Rwanda were very visible when they were passing through to Makerere in Uganda in 1962 for that famous conference. He wrote about it and again reminds us that Rwanda was the land that gave birth to Reda Heger's King Solomon's Mines. Baranos Amos, who served at one time as an advisor on governance to the Nelson Mandela government, and also wrote the second forward as director of the School of Oriental and African Studies, describes the anthology as worthy of history, as it brings Francophone and Anglophone writers together. But that South Africa, the South Africa launch did not happen as planned last year, perhaps had to do with the timing of the gods who give us the stories in the first place, and give us the time for their launch as well. That it is being launched at this time, the centenary celebration of the birth of Nelson Mandela, and the same year of the passing of Winnie Mandela, is a fairy tale end to their startup romance decades ago. This is not to forget again that the month of May on the calendar of the African Union is perhaps more like the day of atonement as we search for development solutions and perhaps also think about our many sins in governance of power abuse and what is physiologically and psychologically the meaning of power. This evening is dedicated to Winnie Mandela for a role in the ending of apartheid and the more positive contributions she made than the few lapses that cynics pretend were what defined her in life. I would like to thank the contributors to this collection, especially those with us on this occasion and those who could not make it. Professor Shoinka, who we cannot thank enough, Professor Indebele, the chancellor of this university and chair of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Dr. Pinky, the immediate past executive director of internationalization at UJ, who wrote one of the three forwards, to Kiswa, currently a fellow, of, a fellow of UJ, that five of the contributors of this anthology are associated with this university is most encouraging of its growth in Pan-African thoughts. The association of the Wolo Shoinka Foundation with the Faculty of Humanities is formalized tomorrow when Professor Shoinka gives the first symbolic masterclass to the selected generation of writers and future ones within South Africa and beyond. And with these brief remarks, I would like to once again thank you for coming to this big lunch. Thank you. Thanks, Doc, for that. Uh comprehensive, though uh, succinct. I mean, that sounds like a contradiction, but it was very succinct and powerful. Um, Ms. Wana, are you okay? Are you ready? Thank you very much. Um, and given that uh, this is Africa Month, you know, every, every month is Africa Month uh, in South Africa, and we celebrate it. Take as much time as you wish. Thank you very much. Good evening, uh, Deputy Vice-Chancellor. Director of Jaius, fellows from Jaius, and fellow Africans. I am delighted to have got this invite to read from my story upon this handful of soil this African month. The first time the soldiers came to Salome Kruger's farm, she had been listening to Katerina reading the Bible out loud to her as they prayed for the burger's success against the English. Dusk was falling. Katerina's daughter, Paulina, and her, elder, uh, and her daughter, Elsie, 
had run in with so much terror on their face that the tongue lashing she had on her lips for the interruption died. Ma, they're here, they're English. Paulina, always more talkative than her Elsie, blurted out. Elsie nodded her, her head vigorously in agreement. Sit. Salome said with more firmness than she intended to the girls. Then a little more gently, as though to calm them and herself down. Stay here, we shall deal with this. And turning to Katerina, she said, let's go. They walked out just as the men and their horses galloped into the yard. The men in charge gave a command and they got off their horses. Some of them made their way to her hen house and took all the chickens there. Others shot the pigs and threw the carcasses on one of her carts, which they commandeered and attached to two horses. Others walked into the farmhouse as though she were not there. She and Katerina followed them. And Salome regretted asking their girls to stay in the house. One of the men, exhibiting sheer cruelty, kicked at Paulina, yelling, silly kaffir. And then it happened. Like a lioness protecting her cub, Katerina ran to him and stretched his face, yelling all the time, yelling, leave my baby alone, you English bastard, fuck off. Salome had never heard Katerina yell, let her alone use bad words. She seemed to realize what she had said, how unladylike she had been, how lacking in decorum as she put her bloodied hand to her mouth. The soldier, Seeing the blood seemed to get incensed. He slapped her and she fell down. Bloody stupid kefir. You think you can touch me? Did your whites not teach you any better? Salome wanted to yell out. She's not a kefir. She's an olamse, the wife of a Greek prince. But words died in her throat. She watched in fascinated horror as this man turned beast and buckled his belt while Katerina screamed. The noise of the other men taking things from her home seemed but a side issue to this abomination being visited on her mother's Olamse, who had been her mother's daughter before she was born. And she was frozen with shock. It was only when he was zipping up his trousers again that power returned to her limbs, and she ran and pushed him in futility. He pushed her back, and she stumbled on the Bible. Dear God, not her too. He was not going to. He saw the fear in her eyes for a moment and leered at her. Then he took out his gun, turned to Katerina, and shot her. It was the casualness of it all. The way he appeared to have so little regard for human life and his dead eyes that made her blood turn to ice. And then Salome screamed. And as she did, she saw her daughter, Elsie, holding on to little Paulina as the two of them sobbed across the room. God, why? That anyone should witness such violence being visited on anyone, but worse, that that violence is being visited on one's mother. And then the British, not content with the horror one of them had visited on Katerina, went crazy, dragging clothes and blankets, breaking plates, struggling with cabinets and wardrobes, antique gifts gifted to her by her parents when they left for the Cape Colony. Everything they did not break, they dragged outside. They'd put it all in a giant heap, outside the house and set the heap on fire. All of them seeming to possess a maddening glim of cruelty in their eyes. Poor little Paulina, poor, poor child. Thank you. And um, I'm now going to ask uh, uh, Prof. Gadi again uh, to also uh, come and share us uh, a comment, a commentary uh, uh, on the collection. Prof, you are most welcome. And I'm going to ask after Prof. Wallace Hinkas join, join us to come and join us to my immediate left, you know, um, of center. Prof, you are most welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to say uh, before uh, I offer a comment uh, 
on, on, on the collection uh, that uh, Professor uh, Woleshoyinka uh, will be presenting a masterclass uh, tomorrow um, here on campus uh, in ELES uh, 200. Uh, and this will be uh, for our students because I have wanted to uh, speak uh, uh, for and about our students. And, and the lecture will take place from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, and that will be in ELS 100 uh, near the auditorium uh, here on campus. And uh, I hope that uh, our students uh, will be there because one of the persistent questions that I get from, uh, from uh, my students is uh, how do I write? Uh, how do I become like uh, uh, the, the, Af the, the great African writers? Uh, my answer is always read, uh, and that is uh, indeed uh, uh, what uh, this anthology is about. And I hope that I'm not uh, out of line uh, here. Um, I would like, and I, would, I had uh, uh, wanted, uh, maybe not on this occasion, but on all occasions, uh, uh, to read a few passages uh, from, uh, from the foreword. Uh, if you could um, indulge me for at least two minutes. And this is from uh, Professor Schoenker's forward, and I hope that uh, I'm not uh, stealing his thunder here. Uh, and uh, uh, this is how um, he... This is how he responded to the invitation uh, to write a foreword for this anthology uh, uh, from the editor. The editor of this anthology's request for me to, to reminisce on the 1962 Makerere Conference on African Literature in the form of a foreword takes me back to, 1980, uh, to 1998 when we revisited Makerere. So there we were again, an all Nigerian delegation, 35 years after the conference of African writers that first brought me to Uganda. We had serious business, but I had an agenda of my own consisting of two parts. One was to track down the birthplace of transition. Transition became uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, major uh, magazines um, uh, to publish uh, uh, writing, uh, critical writing, and of course, uh, reflective writing by African writers. I did not intend to put a plaque on the wall, but I was, after all, visiting Uganda for the first time in some 30 eventful years of Africa's endless transitions post Idi Amin, post Julius Nyerere's Ujama, post apartheid, post mortem Christopher Okigbo, who fell in Biafra, post mortem Robert Serumaga, who disappeared in Moise, Kenya, uh, but most poignantly, post modern Rajat Niyogi, uh, who gave who gave us Africa's first forum of intellectual and artistic eclecticism. Uh, and Rajat Niyogi was the first editor of the journal Transition, of course. He was an inescapable uh, presence at the writers' conference. So there was nostalgia, yes, a remembrance of friends gone, things done, battles lost and won. My second project was very was the very antithesis of nostalgia. When we set out from Nigeria in 1962, we had been on an excursion of creative buoyancy and high optimism. Now we were returning in a season of despondency, of which the most gruesome manifestation was the massacre in Rwanda in 1994. I needed to, to visit Rwanda to confront the realization of my dearest of my direst predictions, had I not cautioned that the fashionable incantation of a humanistic African past might prove a romantic illusion in a dance of the forests, uh, one of uh, Prof. Schoenke's plays, the play I composed for Nigeria's independence and read at the Writers' Conference in 1962. And indeed, uh, what, we are, uh, uh, what we are reading, not only in the foreword of this collection, uh, uh, of, of short stories uh, is, uh, uh, is, is, is an attempt to revisit uh, uh, places, to revisit uh, certain uh, landscape, to revisit uh, certain uh, memories uh, uh, that, uh, that Africa uh, has had to 
uh, to go through. And I do believe that uh, uh, some of, well, some of the stories, of course, are uh, uh, stories that uh, I, I encountered uh, at some uh, point in, uh, during my, my own studies. But I think that what, uh, what uh, drew me to the anthology and what I believe uh, should draw everyone who uh, is here today and those who are not here today uh, is the range of these, uh, of these different revisits, uh, uh, the, 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 the memorialization uh, of memory itself, in other words, that memory itself is a tangible thing, that it is a thing that we must always preserve uh, for, for, the better, uh, for the better health of our, of our continent. Uh, what, I also, um, uh, what I also like about this anthology uh, is, the way, is the way in which it traverses not just uh, the landscape, that is the physical landscape of Africa, but also uh, the psychological landscape. It is, a, it, it is a collection that speaks directly to, uh, to crisis, but also to optimism. And the foreword, for me, captures quite succinctly uh, that idea uh, of literature, not so much as, uh, as, as a document uh, of our times, as a document of our place, as a document uh, of our memories, but also uh, as, as, as productive of those things as well. In other words, the way in which uh, our lives are also uh, produced by the things that we say uh, about uh, about our lives, uh, and and so uh, in my in my understanding uh, of short stories, and I always say that short stories are, uh, are the most difficult uh, genre, uh, most difficult uh, to write. Uh, Precisely because uh, they have to contend with uh, with large uh, social and historical questions within a short space of time, but these stories uh, constitute, uh, in my view, uh, a novel. They they constitute a tapestry uh, that perhaps only a novel can attempt to uh, uh, to 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 represent. Uh, and I'm not going to speak. Uh, on specific stories, uh, but what I am going to uh, to uh, to insist on is that uh, uh, you read these short stories uh, because they are not just for me uh, who would read and teach them; uh, they are for us uh, to understand ourselves and our continent. And with these words, I would also want to. Uh, uh, to say that uh, uh, there is another project uh, underfoot uh, here at UJ, uh, which involves uh, uh, Professor Bole Shoinka's foundation uh, and the Faculty of Humanities. Uh, uh, the, the Wale Shoinka's foundation and the Faculty of Humanities are trying to uh, to bring writers together uh, from Southern Africa, from Swaziland, uh, from Botswana, and from Lesotho. Uh, and the Faculty of Humanities at UJ is also trying to get, uh, to get on board uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, bring writers together. Uh, so all these persistent questions about how do I write, how do I get to, uh, to be uh, a great writer uh, would be answered uh, uh, in, in, in the context of, of this project. Uh, and uh, we are also uh, looking at, uh, at, at, at summer school in which uh, great writers could, in fact, uh, interact with, uh, with young writers. And I know that there are so many of, uh, of the young writers uh, who have sent me their manuscripts uh, uh, here at UJ. Uh, many of my students have sent me their manuscripts and I always uh, feel embarrassed that I cannot do much uh, about those manuscripts but I have kept many of them, and I hope that uh, uh, some of the things that uh, we wish to, uh, to do uh, uh, with, uh, with Professor Shoinka's foundation uh, and the Faculty of Humanities as U at UJ will uh, finally uh, produce that, uh, that, uh, that other dream, uh, which is not just a personal dream, but also a dream uh, that further the interests uh, of the continent. And with those words, I'd like to invite Professor Shoinka uh, to speak to us uh, about, about uh, his experience uh, of, of this anthology. Thank you. So, so, Prof, I really like two words uh, um, from the many um, eloquent and important words you said. Uh, tapestries of revisits. I really uh, love that. Uh, it rang well. Just two health warnings. I clearly was not asked to uh, preside over this, um, uh, this occasion 
because I have something profound to add, but because I've been confused for a bouncer on many occasions. So uh, uh, next time I hear a phone ring with Marvin Gaye's night shift on, uh, I shall ask you to please switch it off. And, 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 and over there, you know, what's this new thing when they speak to each other but the phone is away from them? Uh, what, Instagram? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know what it's called. <laughs> but, um, uh, but could we just ask, you know, to sort of, you know, keep, keep those to a limit? So um, it is now my uh, privilege and pleasure to call a distinguished uh, scholar, essentially a playwright. Um, he is an essayist, a poet, a novelist, a theater, a theater director. And just to borrow from two of the plays uh, that Prof directed, I would like to call him um, The Strong Breed and The Lion and the Jewel. Please join me in welcoming um, Nobel Literature Laureate, Professor Wally Shoyinka. Please join me in welcoming. Thank you, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> sure you can hear me, because I can't hear myself properly even. <clears throat> Good evening, and thank you so much for this warm welcome. <clears throat> it always feels very good to be back in South Africa, and Johannesburg in particular. I was very happy to see that, as usual, the Nigerian clock has uh, followed me here. Um, uh, no matter what appears to be the uh, horrendous uh, relationship in certain quarters, in certain quarters of Johannesburg, I think the truth is that most Nigerians still feel that emotional bond with uh, South Africa which no incident can ever remove, no unpleasant incident. The bond has been there for a very long time, even before we all became conscious of a struggle called anti-apartheid. That bond has been there through the literature that we received from South Africa, through writers, the um, uh, original, uh, shall we say, introducers of South Africa to the Nigerian community, through even teachers like Izikel and Pashlele, who many of you, Uncle Iske, I think you the name given him here, who many Nigerians have never heard of. They used to teach in some of the um, uh, secondary schools over there. Nigeria, in fact, was the first port of call for many uh, South Africans in the very early days before even Nigerian independence. And of course, through them principally, I think, and through journals like the Drum, Drum Magazine, which many people here are too young to know, you Nigerian people. This is where um, I was going to say there are certain words I must avoid today because this man always uses them against me. He has certain favorite words. And if I utter them, I will hear them re echoed later on. So I not mention in the introduction of, um, uh, shall we say, cultural uh, uh, landmarks like the Shebeen and the Skokian. Yes, I've uttered the word. I wouldn't bother with those. But the rhythm, the pulse uh, of South Africa was something which was uh, absorbed, recognized, and identified with by most Nigerians. Then came the beginning of real linkages, uh, not just South Africa, but Mozambique, the um, Portuguese uh, settler colonialism, uh, Rhodesias, etc. And the linkage became stronger and stronger as more refugees flowed from the South to the West. So the literature, the culture, the music, the rhythms were already part and parcel 
of Nigerian life. By the time Makariri happened, of course, this was immediately post-independence, and we became more conscious of a real battle going on. And when I say battle, I mean physical battle. We're talking about uh, anti-Portuguese colonialism, Mozambique, Angola. We're talking now the beginning of movements in southern Africa against apartheid. Uh, Namibia was sort of gray areas. We were never sure what was happening there. But outside of, uh, shall we say, UN uh, protectorates like Namibia, we become very conscious that the axis of liberation on the African continent at one end was in South Africa, the other end in Algeria, in Algeria and the fulcrum. The fulcrum was in West Africa, Ghana, of course. Nigeria was a bit slow on the uptick, but once it started, as usual, it galloped over to Ghana. And so by the time we began talking about the frontline states, Nigeria was already, even with the conservatives like Tafa Balewa, one of our early uh, uh, premiers, prime ministers, the consciousness of Africa of uh, South Africa as the battlefront was something already integral in the consciousness of pupils, school pupils, writers, artists, painters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It percolated through even before we finished our graduation and returned to Nigeria. At that time, we'd uh, become aware that the destination after we finished our studies was. South Africa, we had no other thought in mind. Unfortunately, what interrupted this liberation front was because we realized that we had our own battles on the home front. I felt we'd better take care of that before we started dreaming of the Black International, as we called it, in uh, imitation of, of course, the war against uh, fascist Europe, the beginning of the International Brigade. All this was part of our education, informal education. But then the problems began. And we said, listen, if we don't take care of our back, when we moved south, we'll find that there is no nation that we can call our own to return to. So when writers and artists from different parts of uh, both Francophone Anglophone, Lusophone, Meti Makariri, ideological uh, sides had already been uh, uh, reflected through, of course, the Monrovia and Algeria divisions, even in the OAU. What was happening in OAU, in other words, was already being reflected in the writing, in the interaction of writers and artists. And by the time we go to Makariri, the ideological battle line was already drawn. So when a certain, uh, between the so-called conservatives and the so-called radicals, so when a certain young writer called Wale Shoyinka met his uh, Francophone counterparts representing what you might call the conservative elements in the African struggle, he didn't know into what serious battle, he uh, uh, and battle waters he was jumping, when he did a kind of pastiche, a kind of uh, mimic of Leopold Sarasenghor's poetry and the whole philosophy of negritude. Negritude, we thought, was just an escape, a cultural front for conservatism as represented by most of the Francophones. I didn't know what uh, Pandora's box I was opening when in the midst of the argument between the negritudinists and the non-negritudinists, I read a pastiche of Senghor's beautiful, elegant, leaping verses, as I call it. But we both came from the same culture, the same culture of epic poetry. 
So it was not difficult at all to mimic Senghor's poetry, which derived from what I like to call the leaping rhythms of epic poetry of the African peoples. The whole went in an uproar. I didn't know I'd taken on the entire francophonie of the African continent. Then to make matters worse, I went and coined, in opposition to negritude, tigritude, siwahala. <laughs> I just thought it was a quip, a little, just to say that we also have our own ideology, and it's called uh, tigritude. I know I was taking on the entire scholastic world of the black, Frank, uh, the black francophonie. I didn't know that I was diminishing the entire French academic tradition and that I was unwittingly positing Anglophone literature, culture, history against the Francophonie. It took a while for them to forgive me. <laughs> <clears throat> However, what I want to stress today is that when you look at the reminiscences, you read the, uh, the, the book on Makerere, you have to understand the background. I realize that we're coming from different directions towards the same marketplace, which was liberation, just liberation. Some saw it in physical terms, some saw it in cultural terms, some saw it even in a kind of uh, identity, a sense of identity, which was not yet totally formulated. But we were luckier, and I always tell our Anglophonie, we were luckier in one respect. We did not undergo the assimilative uh, aspect of colonialism, which the Francophones underwent. At that period, when Macarre took place, the Francophones were victims of a very deliberate French indoctrination. The Anglophone, on the other hand, the British, British colonialism felt that the blacks were brutes and couldn't absorb um, British culture, civilization anyway. So let's leave them alone. Let's take just a few people and turn them into bureaucrats and the flag bearers, uh, representatives of British culture in an indirect way. And so we were left severely alone as barbarians. The Francophones, however, already members, there were members, uh, the uh, intellectuals there, already had uh, this kind of token membership of the uh, Académie Française. Who ever heard of, um, shall we say, our early poets, like Azikwe, etc., etc., being invited to become member of the British literary establishment? No. And so we're able to de develop in our own way, in our, with full confidence in African cultures. The Francophone, on the other hand, let me tell you how bad it was that sometimes to be given a visa to go to metropolitan France, let's say even the headmaster of a school or a civil servant, you took a test in French culture. You were invited to the home of a district officer, the equivalent of a district officer, and that dinner was a testing point. How you held your fork, how you held your knife, how you dabbed the lip with a napkin. You were given marks for this. This was sent to Paris, whether you passed or failed. If you failed in the angle at which you held your fork and knife, you weren't going to enter. And so it became a, we were not aware of how deep, how petty French colonialism was. We were so confident in our own ways of doing things. And so we couldn't really understand what the fuss was about, this negritude. We said, we never lost our own negritude. But of course, by the time we started interacting, after Makerere, for instance, after the formation of the Union of Writers of the African Peoples, when we realized that it was senseless 
to have this cultural fight going on on behalf of people who didn't give a damn about what we did, what we were, what we had, how we clothed ourselves. Humanly wanted to see us as a kind of image of their own, either in tepid ways or in full assimilation. And so we closed ranks. It was simple, very easy. Senghor and I became the best of friends, as many of you know. Of course, uh, from, the, uh, from Martinique, I'd always stood on the sideline. He was a bit more ideologically concerned. Uh, he belonged to the school of, shall we say, St. Benio's man, who incidentally, and this is where everything became complicated, St. Benio's man, who was Francophonie, was so progressive in his ideological outlook that he saw the issue as a class issue, as a simple matter of decolonization. And so he, side by side with negritude, he phrased his own position as negritude ne nourrit pas. In other words, as we would say in Nigeria, na negritude we go chop, you know, <laughs> say, give the people food in their stomachs and then you're talking about liberation. <laughs> And so all these petty uh, uh, antagonisms, intellectual antagonisms, the, uh, the overstatement of positions, this is what happened in Makerere. And within a few years, Makerere had been forgotten. And we now recognize that we were engaged, all engaged in a real battle for true liberation decolonization. Not surprisingly, the Liberian, uh, the Monrovian group also, I'm trying to very quickly run through how the politics of the African continent was actually reflected in the cultural ideologies of both sides. The so-called Monrovia group and the, uh, the Casablanca group, one supposed to be radical, the other, um, uh, the other conservative, also came together, resulting after so many, first of all in OAU and eventually in AU. And so similar positions were taken in the cultural division. We began to see the real enemy as an internal one, the main, the major enemy, an internal one. Those who wanted to step straight into the departing shoes of the colonial masters. The same, only even more pernicious level of alienation. The same distancing between the rulers and the ruled. The same denial of human dignity, only worse, because this time the boot was on the black foot. And this is always more intolerable, because it's a kind of double betrayal after so-called liberation. And all this was reflected in the literature. We began to, and by this time we already accumulating more and more works from Southern Africa. Alex Laguma, um, Mazizi Kunene, uh, Lewis Nkosi, who began as a journalist, became a writer himself. They were all present, one form or the other, in uh, Makerere. Kofi Awuno from Ghana, who fell in Nairobi recently. And all began to close, hand, uh, to close uh, ranks. And the literature itself was reflected in that. And if you look at these short stories, uh, you'll see the awakening consciousness of what I like to think of as the authentic product of colonial furnace. We're all toned in the single consciousness of the battle for human dignity. And so people are surprised when we say to one another, yes, yes, uh, there is a kind of uh, phobia taking place on the streets of Johannesburg. It's like, yes, we've seen it. We've been through this before. And even this shall pass. And South Africa is even beginning to give us examples of what to do with our treacherous leaders. I'm not going to say more than that <laughs> right now. <laughs> but I made a statement just before I came here. Uh, traveling uh, from, uh, I was in Abuja, and we were launching a new building dedicated to the fight 
against corruption. <laughs> and I was taken round. I'm trying to say how we've gravitated from that sense of external uh, conflict to internal. There's a real serious battle now taking place. So as the head of the EFCC, that's the, it's called economic uh, fraud uh, something. So anyway, anti-corruption. Just a few days ago, I said, where's the presidential wing of this place? I want to see where you're putting our presidents when they come here. I said, I'm a human rights fighter. I want to make sure they're comfortable because they're going to come here in a really one after the other. It's happening all over the world. It's going to happen in Nigeria. And the two of us, <clears throat> and the two of us are going to join hands for the final battle, the battle for the ordinary, the common man who has been betrayed by leadership along that same axis, which I delineated at the very beginning. So enjoy the literature that has come out of that. There is even more and more telling that will come out of the experience that this continent is going to undergo during the next half, not even a full decade, during the next decade. The movement has already begun and it will not be stopped. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks for reminding us, Professor Shoyinka, that the last time you were here, we had a different head of state um, <laughs> in South Africa. And upon your return, uh, we are now trying to make sense of an ideology called Ramaphoria. So what I mean, we'll, uh, we'll share with you once we uh, unpack some of the uh, details. Just on, a, just on a serious note, just on a serious note, say to Prof, it was brilliant how Prof uh, took us to that uh, historical um, tour de force. Uh, there was the Monrovia and the Casablanca groups. Uh, you told us about uh, Macarere, where the real scholarly debates uh, happened. There was, of course, also um, Dar es Salaam, and not even to forget uh, the school of Ibadan itself. And I think it's also uh, important that South Africa makes its uh, modest contribution. Thank you for that, Prof. It's always appreciated. Now, what we're going to do, uh, I don't know why the uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor said uh, we were running behind schedule. According to my watch, at least, uh, we are on schedule. I'd like to just recognize a few people. Uh, Professor Alex Mezier from Russia is here, and I see colleagues from the Russian embassy, from various embassy. Dr. Sizwe Nasana, always very good to see you, sir. Welcome. I think we should find you an office here at uh, UJ. I mean, uh, maybe the contributions to fees must fall. Uh, might just quadruple, uh, and I just see various colleagues that I'd like to recognize. Okay. So here are the rules of the game. I'm going to open uh, for at least uh, one round. Now, at least might also mean at most, depending how crisp and succinct you are. But without further ado, I'm going to go from right to left, make my way through, and then we're going to have some responses. And I would really like to... Uh, Given Prof's heavy schedule, if we can get out of here by 2015, 2020, the latest, and that is South African time, uh, that would be appreciated. So who would like to go first on my right? The question I would like to ask uh, the distinguished speaker is, why was the whole idea of a fully pan-Africanist continent not possible in your view. What was it that made it impossible at the time of 63 when Casablanca and Monrovia were going? Why was it not possible in your view to have a united continent, which is what I think we should all be striving for? So now that I've been put on the spot and given that decolonization is in the air, 
How would you say Northern or European, American, Canadian, French scholars have interpreted yours and your colleagues' work? Um, has it been progressive? Has it been Eurocentric? Has it assisted you? Where are the variations? And so on. Thanks. When you were talking, you talked about um, how when you were young, you didn't know and, and you acted from the perspective of not knowing, but your actions were significant. Now, I want you to, to maybe contribute to our understanding of how it's significant to act from that energy of being young, the youthful energy, but also how do, you, how do we become cautious as well? Because it's, it's, it's significant to be young, to want change, to want it quickly. But it helps to, to be your age and reflective. But then when you are young, you are not reflective. So how do we balance the two? How do we balance the energy of being, of the youthful energy and understanding that our actions have consequences? Thank you. Uh, Professor Schwinke, I also would like to say that I love you very much. And uh, in Russia, you're very well known. I just would like to give you an example uh, how well you're known in Russia. In the book I just brought to you, and that was published in 1972, of your interpreters, in the preface it was said, the talent of Professor, uh, not yet Professor, the talent of Wally Shoinka is so diverse and uh, so mature that we could excuse his young age. <laughs> Just an example. Thank you very much for your, for your work and for the inspiration you give to us. Yes, um, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Shoinka, not Soinka, Shoinka. Um, I, I want to take you back a bit. Um, many of us read your book, and um, a number of us struggle with one particular book. And um, many people, that is a number of people that look at your books, think that you, you picked at that particular point. And that book was Death and the King Horseman. There's this argument that um, you may never be able to touch that book again. It was an eight, eight-page eight book filled with pro proverbs. Um, I would like you to... I would like to drag you back to the book and drag you and try to compare the two. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Mgadi. Uh, I wasn't expecting that uh, at all. Uh, so I'm going to speak to the last question, and I, I don't think that uh, I can answer it, uh, but I, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to contribute to uh, to that uh, to that question uh, because uh, there was a time when uh, there was uh, another uh, another debate uh, around uh, uh, death and the king's horseman, which is a play about uh, a man who must commit a ritual suicide as part of uh, as part of uh, as part of his uh, his culture, but is prevented uh, from doing so uh, by uh, uh, by the colonial uh, officers. Uh, who say, well, it can't happen, you know, um, uh, under our watch. And his son uh, returns from uh, 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 from England, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, and 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 commits a ritual suicide in his place. Uh, and uh, I think uh, one of the comments, uh, I think, in the in the preface of the play was that, well, the colonial incident is uh, is minor to uh, to the main story, uh, and uh, some readers felt that it was actually the driving force or the the organizing principle behind uh, behind this play and so I would perhaps it's an old question but I would like to uh, to hear Professor Shoinka on uh, what he would say uh, to that uh, debate that raged around uh, death and the king's horseman uh, what it would mean today uh, in the context uh, of decolonization uh, thank you so firstly I'd like to I think uh, reflect on some of the words that uh, Professor Shoinka said I thought it was really deep uh, in terms of, you know, the journey that the continent has has gone through, and also the aspect of of betrayal and how it it develops, but you're looking at your watch now, so you're looking at the time. First of all, let me take the last one. No, I'm not sure um, whether 
Death and the King's Horseman is uh, my favorite, or my best, I'm not sure. It's, it depends on the mood in which I am. Sometimes it's even a, what I call my guerrilla theater sketch, which might be the favorite at that particular moment. I acknowledge, as, a, as a, somebody whose field is literature, teaching and everything, I acknowledge that Death and the King's Horseman is one of my densest uh, uh, works. But I'm not sure if it's the best or not. I leave that to literary critics. Then the question about youth, how do you, was that a question? How do you energize youth? Um, well, youth, as far as I'm concerned, the energy is already there. It's just mostly, unfortunately, misdirected. I've told our youth uh, in Nigeria, for instance, that do you realize what percentage of the population you are? And do you realize what percentage of the vote that means you can muster if you really get organized? And then I say, so for heaven's sake, go and get organized. So some of us can just go and rest. You know, exercise your power in a positive direction. Enter into spaces of governance. Make the difference and eventually take over so we can become permanent pensioners. But they listen, but I don't see much effort in that way. I see them allowing themselves to be co-opted, deciding that they want a slice of their national cake. They want it immediately. But why do you settle for half a loaf when you can mobilize and take the whole? So it's up to them entirely. All we can do is uh, point out those we consider they should avoid and those whom we believe can actually assist them in seizing the future in their own hands. Then the, um, the question, how do um, <clears throat> American and European scholars treat our works? Well, they move beyond the stage of exotica. There was a certain stage when African literature, African arts, if they didn't contain a bit of a raffia skirt and a bit of a uba juba, you know, a mumbo jumbo, it was not African literature. And unfortunately, we had those I call the neotazanists, who also believe that there is no African literature unless it contains uh, cowbells, raffia skirts, uh, heavy bottom shaking, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's, it, it's, it's a mixed bag. Let's put it that way, it's a mixed bag. I would rather talk about schools of criticism, schools of receptivity, uh, those who look at African literature seriously, even when it's from a wrongful ideological point of view, as long as they don't treat African literature as exotica, and as long as they don't also become proprietary, because it becomes a field of context. This is my uh, turf, don't come near here. I'm the expert, uh, nobody can speak on this writer except myself. Uh, nobody can look at that literature except from my point of view. As long as it doesn't become too proprietary, I think uh, literary criticism is a free for all. In the Soviet Union, I don't know what the mood is these days. All I know is that in the Soviet Union, they don't pay royalties. <laughs> <clears throat> so when you go back, take that message. Say that we're all waiting for the Soviet Union to catch up with the payment of royalties. Now we can talk literary criticism with the Soviet Union. <laughs> uh, why did the Africa Union fail in, um, in uh, what, whenever the Union of African Literature? Well, it's very, the answer is very simple. They formed, they settled their quarrel over our bodies. In other words, when they eventually called themselves a union, it was to become united against the populace. An attempt has been made with structures like NEPAD, with peer uh, uh, 
uh, criticism, peer assessment, some effort has been made to try and bridge that abyss, uh, which became very wide the more united they became. Uh, you had at the beginning, for instance, one of the very earliest protocols was non-interference in uh, the affairs of another nation. Uh, the next one, or whichever one I took, the other one was the national boundaries are sacrosanct and should never be. How can you say boundaries are sacrosanct when those boundaries were donated to you by imperialist forces and certainly not in your interest, but in theirs? And then you meet, you say you're a union, a liberated union, and the first thing you do is consecrate the very structures which had been left behind by the imperial forces. So invariably, inevitably, the early union failed. When they finished tearing one another to pieces, of course, they united and then turned on the rest of us. Hence the failure. But there is still hope. I don't want to sound pessimistic. Sorry if I haven't touched the other question. Is this a uh, man? His short hand is very difficult to, 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 to read. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. I'm, I'm now going to, um, I'm now going to all, uh, call Mr. Lebete, um, my left foot, to just come and do a word of thanks for us. And then we will close the night, the night out. Thank you, Prof, and I promise I'll be very quick. Uh, Prof, when we started this journey uh, with Professor Schwinker, it was to bring excellence to UJ, in particular to our students, to further Africanization and to further internationalization. And we're very happy when Prof um, eventually agreed to accompany us in this journey, a journey to UJ as the epicenter of critical intellectual inquiry. Our relationship uh, would be very fast. It'll sprout many tentacles. We will work with partners in the private sector to turn these stories uh, into short films. We will develop new and upcoming writers. We will strengthen writers' associations across the continent. We will develop writers in residence programs. We will link UJ and its students to exchange programs already run by the Soyenga Foundation out of Nigeria. We will develop and run the creative writing series that was mentioned earlier. And with Prof delivering the master's class tomorrow uh, to anchor the first of those series. We will also on Friday, for those who are interested, be at the Soweto campus building on the conversations we started last year where Prof. Soyenga will deliver a follow-up keynote on a long walk to Mandaland, as you've indicated. And he'll be joined in conversations by young and upcoming writers, and some developed. We hope for an exciting five years of your DVP, Prof. Let me thank Professor Sina for representing our Vice Chancellor and welcoming our guests. Thank you, Professor Landsberg, for steering this event. Thanks to Professor Mgadi for being the academic anchor of this DVP. Um, let me thank uh, Evo. It's okay if I call you Evo, right? Um, for this book um, and for all that you do for the Soyinka Foundation and the DVP relations with UJ. Thank you, everybody, for coming, uh, for the engagement. We hope they were fruitful. Professor Soyinka, who, according to the Nobel Prize Committee, in a wide cultural perspective and with poetic overtones, fashions the drama of existence. Your graciousness and humility is always disarming. You continue to give of yourself in the service of humanity. A great example to Ubuntu. We can never thank you enough. And everybody, thank you for coming. Professor Soyenga will be, Professor Shuenga will be signing copies of this book if you've already purchased one, uh, or you can still get one outside. Thank you very much. So, um, so the book is on sale for 238 rands and 95 cents. 
Now, if you buy a copy that Prof and his colleagues will sign, we'll drop the 95 cents. So you can get it for 238 rand. And I've just done that with the powers vested in me. Prof, I, Prof, I don't know how it makes you feel, but I see there's a certain leader in America who now goes to rallies shouting, no bell, no bell, no bell, no bell. So maybe John, Donald Trump will join you one of these days as a fellow Nobel Literature uh, 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 Awardee. Um, it's been great having all of you uh, tonight. Please uh, spend some time with Prof, just a few minutes, but also give Prof some space uh, to go and um, recover. And uh, as for me, I'll still be trying to get hold of some skokajan for Prof. Uh, and hope to give it to him uh, by Friday. It's been an excellent evening. Thank you for coming, and we're looking forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much.